Hey One Tree Hill fans, thanks for being here. If you could hit that like and subscribe button, greatly appreciate it. But either way, I appreciate you being here. Today we are talking about episode 17 of season three, who will survive and what will be left of them. Of course, this is the aftermath of the last episode. So another tough one. Let's get into it. Ugh, starting off at the funeral. But before that, we see a young Danny and a young Keith. As, Danny's, as Dan is remembering this while at Keith's funeral of him killing a raven that was wounded. And Keith said, we can nurse it back to health. And he gets a rock and kills it because it was weak. We're seeing the sociopath emerge in little Danny in that memory. Then we see Dan seeing young Keith in present in the graveyard. Crazy... Crazy Dan is born. Even more crazy. Or just really guilty. Karen and Lucas being the last ones at the graveyard seems appropriate. And through their grief, Haley and Nathan realize once again how much they love each other and how they don't want to lose each other. Sometimes it takes tragedy to make people realize that. And it's such an interesting thing because it's like the only one standing up for Jimmy is, of course, Mouth, even though Mouth doesn't know that Jimmy didn't kill Keith. Spoiler. <laughs> um, but we, that of course, Dan is blaming it on Jimmy Edwards because Dan's an asshole. And Lucas being like, do not speak his name in my mother's house. He killed my uncle. It's just, it's a very impactful moment. Ah, uh, Dan sees little ghost Keith again. Thinks he almost runs him over right in front of Karen's house. Peyton comes in with her dad. Her dad thanks Lucas for saving his daughter. And you see the emotional tension between Peyton and uh, Brooke. But more on Peyton's side because things have kind of shifted. But Brooke doesn't know that yet. Thank you, Naley, for that beautiful scene of your two's conversation in bed about wanting to live together again. And, and here comes Nathan being poetic and charming. And he's like, you haven't even seen my A game. She's like, Lord, help me if that's true. Right? And just, you know, it's Haley James Scott and it always will be. Like, how great was that scene? I mean, our hearts are breaking and now they are filled with love and Naleyness. I'm here for it. Back to our regularly scheduled grief. Uh, we see Lucas uh, destroying the memorial for Jimmy Edwards. And at this stage in his not knowing what really happened, it does make sense. But at the same time, it's like you kind of feel for mouth because he's in a very like limbo kind of. It's, it's not a fun place to be right now. Oh, Brooke getting the material for Karen's wedding dress. That is a sad moment. And then it's like, Haley's like, oh, um, Nathan and I, we're going to be back together. And Brooke is happy for her. But it's like, now we won't be roommates anymore. So it's like this bittersweet moment. It is nice to see Peyton's dad in this episode, you know, being there after everything that happened and just saying, you know, didn't want to get that phone call. That's been too, too many phone calls in my life. And then he sees all the records and he goes, how much allowance am I giving you anyway? Another moment of levity. But she's like, those are Ellie's. I can't bring myself to play them. But yet again, here we come back to the grief. Okay, I totally forgot about the party rave thing that is going on at the school here. Uh, that Rachel, I guess, texted Lucas. And then here comes Rachel taking him into the school. And Brooke's like, yeah, this is... This is like a party. We're all here for each other to heal. And I totally forgot about this. Um, I I don't really know what to make of it, honestly. Um, yeah, I find it a little odd that after a, a shooting, the, the school can just be gotten into by a bunch of students uh, being loud and rowdy without anybody noticing in this small town. But sure, okay, suspension of disbelief. I also forgot about the talk that Lucas and Peyton have in the library of all places, which I would think is like one of the last places she'd want to be back in. And, you know, she's like, they talk about the kiss and he's like, you know, I love you. And she's like, what? And he's like, no, but I'm in love with Brooke. And she's like, okay, well just, you know, it's great to hear and just let her help you with this. Cause I know how you are. And, 
it's just it was kind of a weird conversation almost like I, I don't know I just I don't know kind of don't blame Lucas for like throwing the guy up against the wall who's saying I got shooters in the hallway come on really Mouth is the only advo advocate for Jimmy. No, Luke. Two people died. And, you know, that's when Luke walks away. But side note, can we just talk about how great Brooke looked in this scene at the school with the boots and the cute black outfit and her hair, almost like that 70s look with the headband, I think. Was it headband? I don't know. <laughs> she looked, had like a very, not 70s, she had a very 60s almost look going there. Okay, I don't remember also the... Uh, River Court being on Lucas's entire wall as a backdrop. Didn't remember that. But his his and Skill's conversation was interesting about do you think there's a heaven and you know, is are is Jimmy and Keith in the same place? Because if Jimmy was sick, you know, he's a victim too, which is kind of foreshadowing. A lovely Naily moment. And then we flash to Dan. Uh, seeing Kid Keith again. Guilt Keith. And here comes Dan, waltzing through the apartment door, I believe, of Keith's apartment as Karen's packing it up. I do like the comment. He goes, I saw the light. <laughs> She's like, I doubt it. Once again, Karen gets a good few hits in with Dan, but of course, Dan has to try to make himself feel better with letting Karen know that Lucas is the one that pulled him out of the fire at the dealership. And then Karen goes in and yelling at Lucas about, he, did you think about me for once? You going and in, running into burning buildings and schools with guns. And Lucas is like, if I hadn't gone in that school, I know Keith would still be alive and he feels guilty and responsible. But Keith was going in there specifically to talk to Jimmy. I mean, that, so that's like, information he doesn't have and this is one of those times where it's like I understand Karen's anger but I'm like Ugh. it's like I can see why a lot of people like kind of think that Karen's not the best mom when she has these moments but like it's such a hot topic on the boards online yeah Karen saying sorry isn't gonna bring him back and walking away like that it's definitely a crappy parent moment but like as a person that just lost the person they were going to marry like I get it but like as a mom it's like oh that's devastating to your kid you know so like this is definitely one of those times that people are like Karen was horrible Rachel was a good friend for mouth I guess but it's so crazy with her because I never I always feel like she's playing a game <laughs> Brooke giving the key to the apartment to Haley and Nathan was sweet but I'm like where are you going to go? The montage of Nathan pulling up that tape that Jimmy had him put down to stay on that side of the room and, and Karen crying while Lucas is upset and Dan's going to Keith's grave and all of these things. And then here comes Rachel kissing mouth and saying, I'm the one who released the time capsule, which I totally forgot about too, by the way, which, yeah, you basically got two people killed by releasing that time capsule, Rachel. I am so glad that, you know, uh, Haley and Nathan were there to tell Lucas, it's not your fault. You did what Keith would have done. What Keith would have done that whether you were in there or not. And I'm glad they told him that, you know, because God, he needed to hear it. Oh, that whole freaking speech that Whitey gave saying how Keith was the one that helped him even when he was a kid, you know, high schooler, pulling him back from the darkness after his wife died and telling him that Keith was your dad didn't matter what a paper science said and you being like him, if you don't, you know, follow the examples he set for your life, then this would make this a greater tragedy. Like, ah, Whitey's the best. <laughs> Ah, Dan is so nuts. He's like, like, get away, ghost. You're not going to scare me. And you know why I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight? Because you started this war and I just finished it. And then he spits on his grave. God. Oh, I forgot that Brooks makes the, uh, takes the wedding, uh, wedding, Karen's wedding dress material and makes it into a comforter for Haley and Nathan. How cute. 
Oh my gosh. I love Peyton's dad. Do you know Pete from Freak Out Boy? <laughs> He's in that limo. <laughs> Don't be long. It's like the one time you're back in town and being a parent, that's when the that's when the the guy in the limo shows up, right? <laughs> Okay, is it just me, but the nailiness is, like, turned up to 11 on this episode because Nathan is so loving and sweet and poetic and thoughtful and wonderful and doing all of the things and just, oh my god, it's, like, amazing and I'm here for it. The whole, when she sat on the bed with the, the wedding dress material and she said, if only it were raining. So he's like, I can take care of that. So they're on this. They're on the football field, and here come the sprinklers. Romantic Nathan. And here comes Lucas being wonderful with Brooke. And it's kind of hard to see them being all lovey-dovey and wonderful. It's a sweet moment, but again, it's just, I know what's coming. So it's hard to enjoy the moment. Leave it to Brooke. <laughs> like Peyton said, I'm the one that gets shot, and you're the one that needs consoling. <laughs> I mean, but that whole talk was just like, it was so real because she's like, you know, I care about Lucas and, you know, but he loves you. And it's just, again, it's like, ugh. And, you know, Brooke's like, I just don't want to hurt again. And Jane's like, I'm not going to hurt you. It's like, oh. Ugh. Oh, okay. Peyton's dad is really great in this episode because then he's like, I know your room's forbidden to fathers but with all those records i thought i'd make you some shelves and she's like where's my bed you don't have room for a queen anymore i'm bringing two singles in since brooke's moving in and brooke's like really oh my god oh my god and then peyton's like oh i made out with fallout boy tonight and, peyton, and brooke's like honey we'll find you a boyfriend you don't have to lie about it <laughs> uh poor karen she's like sees that lucas is going to jimmy's um, funeral and she's like no absolutely not you go change right now and he's like no it's what Keith would have wanted and he has Keith's car and him and the guys from the team are going to the funeral I totally forgot about this too uh, that last scene of them walking up and Jimmy's mom being the only one there <laughs> it was just that is an emotional moment <laughs> so I just got done listening to the podcast and I'm going to just say I agree right off the bat that I really did like that Nathan didn't miss a beat. He was continually saying it doesn't matter to every problem that Haley was uh, pointing out. So that was really cool. Sophia's story of losing someone in tragedy and her friends pulling together to take her out to celebrate life is a good illustration of how everyone really does grieve quite differently. And it does kind of reinforce the whole finding joy and peace in life because you never know how much time you have essentially um but it is about respecting everybody's process too um yeah i have to say the whole pete of it all showing up or not really showing up um that was weird um it was weird timing um they did show the conflict of compassion, anger, and wanting justice. They did illustrate that very well. Completely understand why Hillary was tired. She was constantly having to do a majority of the heavy lifting when it came to the severe emotions on this show, for sure. And I never really thought about that. The fact of, you know, them killing off Keith could certainly make the other actors feel like they their jobs weren't safe either. So, like, Karen being hurt and angry, um, you know, that Sophia's perspective on that was really helpful to aid us in knowing why Karen said what she did to Lucas ultimately. But Hillary's story was interesting, too, in the fact that she pointed out that, you know, Keith was the good cop, Karen was kind of the bad cop. So there was no one to pull her back from that ledge at that point. So that was a really interesting point. And I have to say that Joy's story was so heartbreaking. I mean, losing a pet is a different kind of pain. And a family pet and her kid, you know, ultimately being, you know, cause of that, uh, that pet dying and having to not tell your kid at that moment and her having to balance that anger and hurt and want for justice and you know just i mean mom life man i don't envy y'all <laughs> 
good point about Lucas getting yelled at by his mom and then being, oh, hey, Brooke, yeah, sleep in my bed. Hillary's right, man. Teens are very messy. And Whitey will always be my MVP. I mean, I do love that he's like, yeah, I'm not here, as he pours himself a beer from the keg. <laughs> Antoine really showed his skills in this scene with Lucas as he was a very grounding person in that moment for Lucas in a very serious, tumultuously, seriously tumultuous moment where Lucas really needed that grounding in that moment. It, it, it is true. You know, this show is a very, it is true. Watching people feel feelings. It's a very good way of explaining it. Paul did 100, 200% commit to his character. Um, and especially this episode, you really see him descent into that darkness and, you know, cling to it. And I've dealt with enough liars and sociopaths in my life to know that they do, in fact, cling to their lies. Their lies become their reality because they would rather go through the hell of it than actually... God forbid they admit their faults, you know. I've uh, dealt with enough of that to know that it is an unfortunate uh, aspect of the world. And uh, there's just a lot of selfish assholes out there. And, you know, it's really true that, you know, it is surprising to see Rachel actually admit her faults in this because that's not really something you would expect from her character. And Mouth was absolutely in a rock, between a rock and a hard place in this episode. Okay, I can totally understand why <laughs> Hillary was not loving her brother being an extra making out with somebody on set. Ew, indeed. Um, you know, it is, again, a contradicting moment when the Pete of it all showed up and her dad and Pete and dad like, yeah, um, I can't I don't want you to go, but I'm gonna let you go. Very contradicting moment there. And I can totally believe that the writers did regret killing off Keith, but I can absolutely believe it was probably about money and, again, making the other actors feel insecure about their own jobs. And I'm just going to chime in and say, yeah, um, when you have pets, um, eating something off the floor, even after it's been on there a few seconds, really not, not advisable. <laughs> But that's it for me, guys. Thanks for being here. As always, hit that like and subscribe button, and I will see you next week.